Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Cathedral of St. John Berkman's. Thank you for being here for yet another Adult Faith Formation morning. Today, it's all about that great early doctor, St. Augustine, one of my favorites. Um, and it's so interesting how you can read the things of St. Augustine from so many different perspectives. I remember in the seminary uh, studying philosophy, and so we read it from a very philosophical point of view. Then later, I was studying theology, then it's all about his theology. Some people read it for the history, others as kind of a, a spiritual direction. St. Augustine is a spiritual companion, someone who helps them on the road that leads to eternal life. That's how Pope Benedict XVI described St. Augustine as his vade mecum, the, the companion for the journey. And so hopefully each one of you has a special saint, that, that companion who accompanies you on the journey. And as I think you know, you've heard plenty of homilies of mine, uh, quoting St. Augustine, I mean, he's obviously very, very much a favorite of mine as well. So today we get to learn more about this great saint, and there, there are just so many phrases of his that have um, impacted me, and I know have impacted many a person. So, for example, he's the one who said, our ascent to heaven is the same as our descent into oneself. In other words, sometimes we, we, it's like we have to travel and go everywhere in order to find God, but really all you, have, all you have to do is go down deep into your heart, and that is itself the ascent to heaven. Or the whole notion of sin, being in corvatus in se, being so turned into oneself that that is what uh, sinfulness is, um, whereas we're supposed to be so directed outwards. Our own gospel today, loving God, loving neighbor, you know, it, it has us looking outward. Uh, late have I loved thee. I mean, we, we know that particular saying, and we'll, we'll hear more about that later this morning. Um, again, so many beautiful things of St. Augustine. I would like to begin with the collect that we hear from the Mass of St. Augustine, and then we will begin the formal um, time together. Let us begin. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Renew in your church, we pray, O Lord, that spirit with which you endowed your servant, Bishop St. Augustine, that filled with the same spirit, we may thirst for you, the sole font of true wisdom, and seek you, the author of heavenly love. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. And now I invite Dr. Cheryl White to lead us in this lecture, as she has done. She's from LSUS here in town, um, and the uh, great historian and plenty of people in, in Shreveport know her very well, and, and beyond, and many people who join us either live or watching later. So, Dr. Cheryl White, thank you. Thank you, Father Peter. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. So today, we get to talk about arguably the most significant figure, uh, most significant Christian thinker, probably besides St. Paul. Uh, this is certainly true for the first millennium of Christianity. Um, St. Augustine, our subject today, is responsible for, really for completely and seamlessly grafting Greek classical philosophy. As Father Peter mentioned, uh, studying him in, in philosophy, he is really the one who's responsible for for completely, and, and I would say seamlessly, uh, grafting that Greek classical philosophy, Platonic philosophy, into Christianity. He is responsible for articulating a vast theological system that continues its great influence in, in the world to this day. And I want to say a word before I begin, because this is kind of a little segue, but um, a word before I begin about this painting that you're looking at is, uh, is actually Fra Angelico's, um, Blessed Fra Angelico's painting. It's called The Conversion of St. Augustine. It was painted in 1435. And, um, and, and actually, I chose this because there's often a disconnect, I think, in, between the, the way that you read um, uh, Augustine in Confessions. If you, if you read his if the in Confessions in its entirety, it has always seemed to me like there's a disconnect between the Augustine you encounter there 
and the Augustan who is depicted in our work across the centuries. Um, he's always, almost always, in artwork depicted as this very strong figure who is normally either writing or you know, there's that famous one of the ball of fire, right? The, the Holy Spirit coming to him in his study. Um, but you don't often see him shown this way, which is the moment of his conversion. To me, this depicts that moment when he realized with certainty that he is completely and utterly dependent upon God's mercy and grace. And that's the scene that you see here. It is out of perspective. There's no question. If you look at, and we've had some discussion about this morning about, um, from the commentaries, it's difficult to know if Fra Angelico intended for this to be his mother, St. Monica. Uh, she does not have a halo, so that leads to some question uh, about that. Is that supposed to represent St. Ambrose over in the far corner? But you can see that everything's kind of out of perspective, but that was not really the point. Fra Angelico was not an artist for art's sake. He was an artist for the church. So uh, I, do, I do love this because I think it captures the honest and overwhelming grief of the moment uh, that he realized that he was completely dependent upon God. You may have heard me say this before. I, I think when we talked about St. Ambrose, uh, I said this. One cannot have a discourse about any major the Christian theological theme without invoking his thought without invoking his influence, his name, his writings, even if you don't know who he is. Did y'all remember me saying that? This is how important he is to, to, to uh, this theological system that, that he promotes. To consider the nature of man's free will, the concept of original sin, God's grace, the purpose of baptism, uh, any of those is to necessarily have to appeal to St. Augustine's influence. To ponder the mysteries of heaven, hell, purgatory is to necessarily appeal to St. Augustine's influence. The many written works that he left behind um, shaped later medieval and early modern uh, thinkers, uh, even in the secular sense. His impact, I think, cannot be overstated, either in the, the realm of Christianity or in, in secular history. Uh, even if, not surprisingly, his position of prominence and authority has been challenged in the postmodern era. Now, how many weeks have we sat in here? Have I said that every single week so far? Every single week. It won't come as a surprise to you that this person's influence and position has been questioned by postmodern scholars. And, and this is certainly true of St. Augustine as well. His most famous work, uh, arguably, most famous work, his Confessions, is an autobiography. And it, it really is quite unique in the ancient literary uh, tradition. There was not really a genre for what he was doing when he wrote Confessions. It's considered by many to be the first true autobiography uh, in history. It greatly, of course, influences the style that would come after him, um, it's sometimes been called philosophy from a first-person perspective. It's also been called that. It's very, very difficult for history to label him, to pin him to a specific era, because he is both classical and ancient, okay? And yet he is also medieval. It's almost as if he has like one foot in each world. Many scholars call him the first medieval philosopher, even though he doesn't technically belong to the Middle Ages. At the time of his death, in the year 430, the Western Roman Empire was just passing away. Um, now, just to sort of keep this in some, some context for you so you'll know the framework we're talking about. So the Western Roman Empire, the dating of that, traditionally the, the fall of that is dated to the year 476, specifically because that's the year the city of Rome, was, the city of Rome itself was overrun by the barbarians. But really in 410 is the year you have the first major barbarian incursions in the, in the West from the Goths. And so, and the Vandals, of course, came to North Africa. So Augustine is living at the, at the end of that first wave of incursions and certainly was aware that the Western Roman Empire was passing away. Um, he did not 
therefore inhabit the Roman world uh, that St. Ignatius of Antioch, for instance, occupied, or St. Polycarp of Smyrna, he didn't occupy that Roman world, but he's also not medieval. We haven't passed into the medieval world yet. So uh, obviously he's not going to inhabit the same world that St. Thomas Aquinas does in the high Middle Ages. He lived in a Roman Empire, a Christian Roman Empire that was struggling to hang on. And, to be fair, as you've already heard him here before, a Christian Roman Empire that was, that was wrought by doctrinal controversies, uh, heresy still being sorted out, all discussions to which he not only contributed, but significantly shaped their eventual outcomes. You'll be relieved to know today that we don't have any new heresies to talk about. Okay? For the review purpose, we don't have any new ones to talk about. But obviously, he's going to be dealing with, uh, with some of the major ones we've already discussed, and particularly Pelagianism, uh, which we will go back and, and, and highlight a little bit, because so much of what he writes comes from an answer to, to that particular heresy. In the pure discipline of philosophy, he continues to inform to this day about <clears throat> concepts such as virtue and ethics. Um, you really can't have a, a secular philosophy class about ethics without, without talking about Augustine. The eternity of the human soul, the pursuit of happiness, and I could just go on and on and on, uh, the, the things that he contributes to our contemporary discussions about. So I think it's fair to say it is absolutely impossible to say too much about this man. You can't say too much. And fortunately, we also know a good deal about his life. He was born Aurelius Augustinus, uh, is his name, uh, born in the year 354 in what is today modern-day Algeria, um, North Africa, today modern-day Algeria. His mother, Monica, St. Monica, was a devout practicing Christian. His, his father, Patricius, uh, received Christian baptism on his deathbed, which was not uncommon in that time, by the way, um, to, be, to be baptized at the end of one's life. You might remember we discussed that with regard to Constantine. Constantine the Great, the first Christian Roman emperor, waited until the end of his life to be baptized. And part of that is because there, is, there does seem to be some fluidity among early Christian thinkers about what the meaning of baptism was. And thanks to this thinker, thanks to this thinker and, um, and his answer to Pelagi, uh, Pelagius, we, we do have, uh, from this point forward, a much clearer understanding of what baptism is going to, to signify and when it should be always done. So, when possible, always done. So, um, Augustine, uh, excuse me, Augustine. Okay, let me tell you, let me stop and tell, tell you a story real quickly. Does everybody know that there is St. Augustine of, of Hippo and there is St. Augustine of Canterbury? Know the story? Have, have I told y'all this story before? Okay, so um, when I was in graduate school, I had a professor who insisted that because the word in Latin is August, that when you're speaking of St. Augustine of Hippo, it is pronounced St. Augustine, okay? But when speaking of Canterbury, it should be St. Augustine. And this was his argument, because in the English, it's August, not August. And so I was taught these two different pronunciations, which is maddening, because nobody else, I got out into the real world and realized nobody else does that. But it's still, I catch myself doing it. So forgive me if I do. This is St. Augustine, obviously. Um, but he was particularly drawn to the study of rhetoric, public speaking. Uh, his parents sent him to be, uh, to be educated in Carthage, uh, again in North Africa, and uh, an education that, that they supported. He enjoyed this academic life very much. He really loved being in academia. And it was there that he began to hone his considerable intellectual gifts. And it was in Carthage that at the age of 18, he began a lengthy, apparently monogamous, relationship with a woman who bore him a son, Adiotus, who was actually baptized with his father. I don't know if you remember this story, but when we talked about St. Ambrose baptizing uh, St. Augustine in, in Milan in 387, I told you the story about him being baptized with, with his, his son, Adiotus. Um, Adiotus actually died um, shortly after that, as a matter of fact, at the age of 18. 
It was also here that um, that St. Augustine became attracted to the philosophy of Monarchianism. Monarchianism. It's an ancient a Persian a dualistic religion. Dualistic religion meaning, of course, that there is a, there's a struggle uh, between equal forces of good and evil, dark and light. A dualism meaning there's a, there's a struggle between what are considered to be equal forces. And the emphasis here, as I said, is is on is on the duality. And it was very popular in the ancient world. Now it has you really don't find Monarchianism in the world today. It's, it, was a, it was one of those ancient mystery cults that, that sort of began to fade away by the time of the early Middle Ages. Uh, but his interest in Monarchianism lasted for about a decade and greatly distressed his mother, St. Monica. Then in the year 383, uh, he moved to Milan to take a position as a professor of rhetoric. You might remember that this is when, because of his interest in rhetoric and because of his interest in hearing people speak, uh, he was always interested in, uh, in, in going to hear people who were good speakers. This is what first drew him to St. Ambrose, who was at the time Bishop of Milan, and uh, he had heard that Ambrose was a great preacher, a great orator, and so he wanted to hear him. From a purely academic perspective, as someone who taught rhetoric, right? So he first heard St. Ambrose preach. And from St. Ambrose, he began to learn about the Christian scriptures. He was taught about, um, learned from Ambrose, something called allegorical interpretation. In other words, not a literal reading of the text, but to seek the deepest possible meaning uh, of the text, something that he the deepest possible universal meaning, which is something he devoted much of his scriptural study for the rest of his life to doing. He said at this time that he found a group of Christians who were, quote, philosophically inclined, end quote, to reach a deeper understanding of Christianity, and that he found this far more intellectually satisfying than the Monarchianism that he now felt himself leaving behind. And, and I think it's, it's clear from reading Confessions that although the moment of his heart's conversion might have been very dramatic, the process of getting to that moment was gradual and intellectual um, for him. But he saw himself increasingly leaving that behind. You'll recall that he was baptized by St. Ambrose on Easter, uh, either, either late uh, or early in the morning, uh, the Easter Vigil, or early in the morning of Easter Sunday of 387, and he returned to North Africa, uh, accompanied by his son, uh, some friends, and his mother, who died on the journey. His mother actually died uh, on the way back. Uh, she died in Osti in Italy. And having lived to see her son's conversion and his baptism, uh, and then she died. In 391, he was ordained a priest, in the Diocese of uh, Hippo Regius, uh, which is the, actually, this is an ancient city, doesn't exist anymore, except for ruins today. Uh, about five years later, about the year 396, uh, he became the bishop there, and the rest, as they say, is history. His written work is massive. He was prolific. We have more of his writings than we do of anyone else of the early church, for the rest of his life, as the Bishop of Hippo, he was always involved in controversy. Always involved in controversy. Not any kind of personal controversy or scandal, but always involved in controversy regarding heresies within the church, um, issues that he was addressing, uh, weighing in on intellectually in, in the church. We've already explored a little bit about, about Donatism. You'll remember that heresy maybe um, in Pelagians. Uh, most of the numerous works he left behind were inspired by intellectual encounters with them. Remember that the Donatists were ones who saw themselves as the pure church. Do y'all remember this? That, that um, those who had renounced their faith during times of persecution or for fear of persecution, that the Donatists believed that there was no way for them to return to the church. They should not be permitted to return to the and uh, so he, he wages some intellectual battle with them. 
and uh, and also of course because because he wrote so much against that particular group. Um, it's interesting. Donatism and Pelagianism both really inform uh, the, that theological system I mentioned at the very beginning that he began to forge very early. Both of them in different ways are, are, are sort of the, the driving force behind that. Because he wrote so much against the Donatists, for instance, dealing with them intellectually, St. Augustine began to sharpen his focus about God's grace, uh, his endless love, his endless mercy to all, to everyone. Um, and writings like these are the reason why he is known as the doctor of grace. So Pelagianism, for Donatism, I'm going to give sort of a review of that. Pelagianism held that that human nature, uh, the human being was by nature um, free. We are free. And since we are created with, with free will, complete free will, then we are able to not sin. We could choose to not sin if we only worked hard enough at it. And, uh, and, and again, St. Augustine vigorously promoted our dependence upon grace, a notion he first put forward with great clarity in Confessions. That's what that work is really about. The core of it is his complete, his own personal complete dependence upon God's grace. And, um, and, and, and so the, he responds vigorously to Pelagianism, but not, not without charity, as you're going to see. I, the, it's one of the things that I absolutely admire so much about this individual is uh, sort of he stands in contrast to perhaps the one we, we looked at last uh, two weeks ago if you'll remember St. Jerome, who was not always the most charitable, right? Not always the most charitable. Um, St. Augustine has a, um, a beautiful way of dealing with those with, which he, with, with whom he disagrees. And, uh, and it's probably a lesson for all of us there. So other North African bishops uh, began condemning Pelagius and his views. And around the year uh, 412, uh, Pelagius traveled to Palestine, where he found uh, the Eastern clergy, uh, clergy of the Eastern uh, Church, a little more sympathetic to his views. But by this time, it also happened to be uh, the time when the great scholar St. Jerome uh, was living there, who had absolutely no reservations in condemning Pelagius too. So it's interesting to see the contrast between the way Jerome addresses him and the way St. Augustine does. They're saying the same thing, but quite differently. At the heart of the conflict is that Pelagianus said that St. Augustine, because he insisted on radical grace, this radical, unbridled, unlimited grace as redemptive and necessary to all humanity, that, that Augustine was essentially denying free will. That Augustine was somehow saying, that man did not have free will to choose. To counter that, Augustine said, well, well, Pelagianists are denying original sin and therefore making Christ's sacrifice on the cross meaningless. If, if man can choose not to sin, then man does not need a redeemer. Okay, so you see sort of what the heart of the controversy is here? Why we're, they're, they're pitted against each other this way? He wrote two lengthy books against Pelagianism that have survived uh, today, and they're lengthy. Um, you'll note they're not in your reader. Um, there's a, you're always, always welcome to go and read anything else you'd like, but they are quite lengthy. Uh, one of them is called The Predestination of the Saints, which is probably the most commonly referenced one, and then uh, The Gifts of Perseverance. His response to Pelagianism uh, from the core of some of the most significant teachings he has on grace come from about 20 years that he spent just on this subject. Just on this one subject. It is what led him to articulate the doctrine of original sin. Um, Augustine concentrated on the truth of um, what he called the fall of man and its consequences and the transmission of sin uh, from Adam into, into uh, his descendants. He also explores a man's nature as being what he calls total depravity. Total depravity. He dwelt at length 
on the corruption of man's nature. And that man does not naturally move toward God without grace. Okay, it's all about God's tug on us through the extension of grace. Because we do have free will, he says. But that free will is always being exercised through a corrupted human condition. So because we are not able to exercise that free will on our own to gravitate toward God naturally, it is therefore because of God's grace, God's tug on us that we respond. And he says this is always going on, right? Um, so as a result of this, um, you know, the, the, the free grace of God becomes so apparent throughout, throughout all of his writings, not just confessions, uh, but those two works I just referenced, he goes into great detail about. Um, and to be clear, obviously this is a theme that is going to be picked up in the Protestant movement. Does some of this sound familiar? This total depravity? It's the same terminology that John Calvin used, for instance, uh, during the Protestant movement. Um, Calvin drew pretty heavily upon, uh, upon St. Augustine, although he, he perverts it a little bit. Um, but it's the same theme, man's total depravity and total dependence upon God. God must save since we are not, since we are unable to choose him without his help. And that's, that's sort of the, the core of, of this Augustinian system, is that we are unable to choose without his grace. Our obedience and response to God is God initiated through the extension of his grace to us. So he ultimately conceded that because God is absolutely sovereign, God's omniscience cannot be questioned. In other words, he is all-knowing. He is all-sovereign. Therefore, he knows all things. This is what Augustine means when he speaks of predestination. That we are predestined because God foreknew. God knows what our choice will be. Not that we don't have a choice, but that God already knows. Does that make sense? So, so this is a little bit, um, it just, just, just to sort of make some distinction between, between what Augustine means by predestination and, for instance, what later Protestants will mean by predestination, which is a much, it's much more of a system for the Protestant Reformation, is, is much more of a system of God having already pre-selected, pre pre-elected, pre-selected, those for damnation. It's a different way of looking at it. Do you see? In the Augustinian view, it's not that God wishes this or desires it. It's that he already knows how man will exercise his will because God is absolutely sovereign. And, and therefore, that that's the only way you can reconcile God's sovereignty with man's free will. So again, this whole theological system, he worked out over 20 years, and you, you're welcome to go and read uh, more about it if that really interests you. But, um, but he is... Again, it all goes back to grace and, and, the, and the perspective that, that man, in order to love God, has to be created free, right? Because love is not love if it isn't freely given. That's something else, but it's not love. So man must be free to love his creator and to choose his creator. So, St. Augustine said it this way, quote, A man's free will, indeed, avails for nothing except to sin. Man's choice of God is at God's prompting. It is the gift of grace that turns man back towards him. God's love is shed in our hearts, not from what arises within ourselves, but through the Holy Spirit, which reaches for us. And I think that's, that's quite beautiful. I love another quote of his, and we could spend a long time talking about this one, but we won't. But there's a quote of his I absolutely love, and Father Peter referenced this uh, briefly, that there's so much of what he wrote that you can take pieces of, right, quotes that stand alone, but then when you put them on their own, when you, when you set them out there, you, they, they automatically draw you into, we, like we could talk for hours about this one quote that I want to share with you. 
Uh, it's a theme that the Protestant movement picked up later, especially Calvin, um, and that no one uh, that that no one should speculate about who is among the elect, who is among God's elect. We're not supposed to speculate. And he was certainly no universalist either, by the way. And this is what he said. I love this. Two criminals were crucified with Christ. One was saved. Do not despair. One was not. Do not presume. Right? One was saved. Do not despair. One was not. Do not presume. These questions also led St. Augustine to explore more about heaven, hell, purgatory. Purgatory is something he makes numerous references to, by the way, uh, especially in his work, The City of God. Uh, many references to, as, as well as many of his sermons, uh, he is one of the most often cited early sources on the doctrine of purgatory, uh, which seems to have been well established by the time he is writing in the late 4th and early 5th century. It also led him to, uh, to an exploration of baptism, uh, something that the early church, as I said, was working out. Many did not receive baptism until the end of their lives. Uh, as adults, this was not uncommon, since some seemed to believe, certainly as Constantine, the, the, whole, the, uh, the, the first Christian Roman emperor seems to believe, is that it conferred for, uh, forgiveness of all sin. And so um, the idea was that you waited as long as possible, right? But because of St. Augustine's theological system and his exploration of grace, uh, drawn from sacred scripture and from sacred tradition as he was interpreting it from the earlier fathers, baptism achieves the removal of original sin, the sin of Adam that is transmitted into all of us. Uh, and therefore, baptism is for infants. It is to remove the taint of original sin. And this led to some interesting speculative theology on the part uh, of Augustine, which, which has gotten a little bit of a bad reputation throughout the years uh, of church history, throughout the centuries. So I, I do want to take just a minute to talk about this because I, I think that it is uh, perhaps clarifying uh, to, to, to talk about. How many of you have ever heard the term limbo? Okay. How many of you believe that limbo is an official teaching of the church? Or ever was? It isn't. And it never was. But what's interesting is that this comes about, and the word in our vocabulary uh, comes about uh, because of this exploratory theology of St. Augustine. As he was articulating the doctrine of original sin, and then trying to take it to its next sort of, um, of iteration and what, what that would mean logically for baptism, is he began to explore well, what, happens, what happens to babies who are not baptized, who die without baptism. And, and it, he, he became, began referring to this um, as the limbo of infants. Not necessarily of describing this as a literal place, okay? Limbo meaning more, I don't know. You know, we don't, we don't know what happens to unbaptized infants. They are left to the mercy of God. And later, by the high Middle Ages, what happens is, certainly by the time of, of um, the scholastic era, like between about 11th and 13th century, the time when St. Thomas Aquinas is living, uh, St. Anselm, Peter Abelard, others like that, who were writing on the same topics, they take this and interpret it as a literal place. Okay? as a literal place. Actually, St. Thomas Aquinas does not mention limbo, by the way. Does not mention it in, in the Summa at all. But, but these other writers do. And the, the council that debated um, this particular notion actually met during Augustine's lifetime in Carthage uh, in the year 418. And there is actually a canon from that council, the Council of Carthage in 418, that specifically addresses this limbo uh, and it says, there is no intermediate place for unbaptized infants. Um, but yet, both St. Jerome and Pope St. Gregory the Great, who we'll, we'll be talking about next week, we'll be touching on this again, uh, Pope St. Gregory the Great also held a similar view, uh, that there must, be, there must be an explanation. There had to be something they call this limbo, 
because Augustine's influence was so great, was so great upon St. Jerome and later upon Pope St. Gregory the Great that they picked up that theme. And again, and I'm going to stress this, by the time that St. Thomas Aquinas is writing his Summa uh, Theologica in the high Middle Ages, he does not mention it. But, but I know that, that when, I was, when I was growing up, and, and before I actually um, became Catholic, I mean, I was unchurched, and I remember as a child hearing people talk about the Catholics in limbo as if it were some official doctrine. And I, have, I, I honestly haven't heard much about it in recent years, but I still occasionally get asked the question by students who have heard this. It is not, it is not a teaching of the church. Um, so, and, and I think again, um, referenced by the fact that, that you have uh, councils that weigh in later, Council of Lyon in like the 13th century, the Council of Florence in the 15th century, the Council of Trent. So, so if anybody ever asked you about that, you can blame St. Augustine for even bringing it up, <laughs> right, bringing the question up. So much of his theological exploration was prompted by Pelagius, though. Um, Pope Innocent I, incidentally, excommunicated Pelagius in the year 417, and you would think that that would have been the end of it, right? Um, but his teaching remained popular, and, and a thread of it actually continues in some form or variation uh, even to this day. Uh, there's something I found interesting I referenced before and perhaps timely in all of this. After Augustine wrote two books against Pelagius' teaching, and one year after the Council of Carthage, okay, 418-ish, condemned him, Augustine responded to Pelagius with this letter. And I want to read you, that, that just think about the great doctor we looked at two weeks ago, St. Jerome. How St. Jerome might have begun a letter like this. Remember? I cannot speak your name without using profanity. This is how Augustine writes to Pelagius. To Pelagius, my Lord, greatly beloved, and my much longed for brother. From Augustine, I send greetings in the Lord. I am very grateful for your kindness in cheering me by a letter from you and in giving me news of your welfare. May the Lord treat you kindly, my greatly beloved friend, and much longed for brother, with such blessings that you may be ever blessed and may live eternally with him who is eternal. Right? He goes on, you know, I cannot be ungrateful for your goodwill towards me. At the same time, I urge you rather to pray for me that the Lord may make me what you imagine I already am. Correct. <laughs> but isn't that beautiful? I mean, it is, it is truly, truly a charitable way to address uh, an adversary. And it certainly they saw themselves as adversaries. So despite writing against Pelagius, and despite Pelagius' condemnation of Augustine in a very public way, by the way, Augustine treated him with genuine kindness. He called him a beloved lord and brother. So I think you can discern um, a genuine attempt on his part to extend uh, that, that charity. And I think it is related to something, um, uh, of course, that St. Paul said, but, but Augustine uh, stressed as well in many of his writings that love believes and hopes all things. That's very common he, he repeated that a lot. Love believes and hopes all things. And he believed that Pelagius was dead wrong. He believed he was dead wrong. But he did not give up on Pelagius. And what would have been, what would have been the thing that would turn Pelagius' heart to the truth? Would it be Augustine condemning him or deriding him or shaming him? Or would it be to treat him with kindness, with true Christian charity? So I think you see Augustine really rising, um, and as a Neoplatonist, you could see him thinking that way, that you rise above such things. And this is what led Augustine to say something that I quoted in here a few weeks ago, and it is, it is so timely, and it, it's one of my absolute favorite quotes of all time from anyone, when he said, if you win an argument 
but you lose a soul for Christ. Who did your argument serve? If you win the argument, but you lose the soul, who are you serving? And this, this, this emphasis on, on love of neighbor and charity above all. So naturally, th th there's sort of some fallout from this, because naturally you might imagine how Pelagius would seize upon a letter like this and use it to defend himself. Well, look how Augustine wrote to me, right? how lovingly he wrote to me. And he did use it to defend himself. And the other bishops of North Africa turned on Augustine a bit and expressed some surprise at the way he addressed Pelagius, to which Augustine responded, quote, I added the epithet most beloved, for it is love above all that marks the Christian, even the love of enemy. So he knew that love marked the Christian, especially perhaps those with whom we do not agree. Is that a little bit timely, maybe? So although he was attacked by his own camp and by the Pelagians, um, Augustine maintained that he would not back down on the essence of what he saw the Christian life to be, love for God and therefore love for neighbor. He would not back off of that. He did have um, fierce intellectual battles with pagans as well, especially true after the year 410 when I talked about those, those the first major wave of barbarian incursions that come into the West when the city of Rome uh, itself was sacked the first time by um, King Alaric and the Goths the first time. He, um, it was then that St. Augustine began writing uh, his work, The City of God, which is the other major work besides confessions that most people read, is, is The City of God. The City of God, you see, is an answer to um, pagans who are, who are arguing that, that the fall of Rome is directly attributable to the Christians. Because until the, the Roman Empire became officially Christian, the, that became an official state religion uh, at the end of the 4th century, Emperor Theodosius I in 395, that until the empire was Christian, they were doing just fine. So it was Christianity that had weakened the empire, and therefore this was the reason that Rome was passing away. So Augustine answers that argument in the city of God, and he does it in this purely... This is why he's called a Neoplatonist, meaning taking Plato's philosophy and infusing it fully into this Christian explanation that the city of God is the eternal place. That's the realm that matters. The human city, the earthly city, the city of Rome, for instance, doesn't matter. Rome is passing away. All things here are passing away. And that we should keep our focus on those things which are eternal. So um, this is why, again, he is, he is often studied in philosophy. That work alone is, uh, is, is studied in a secular sense just because of what it articulates about Plato's Republic, uh, Plato's great dialogue, the Republic, which he references many times, and a hierarchical kind of governance for the church uh, and the state. So... <clears throat> Augustine died um, at the age of 76 in Hippo Regis, his sea city, having four years before already stepped down uh, as bishop because of uh, and, and, and uh, sort of overseeing um, the next bishop, uh, Heraclius, who came in, uh, overseeing the early part of his episcopate. Uh, because of failing health and because he wanted to, um, to, to sort of oversee that transition, especially given the conditions of the Roman Empire and in that particular area of the Roman Empire, maybe, maybe most of all, uh, was concerned about that and, and, and stepped away uh, the, for the last four years. But um, his interesting, strong, and often funny personality, I think, comes through in a story that is told of this great doctor of grace on his deathbed. When the city of Hippo Regius was being sieged by the vandals, and men wounded in battle were sending word to him asking him for prayer. I mean, you can imagine 
the reputation he already had by the end of his life. And um, as these requests came in for prayer, he was quoted to respond, and this is given in, in the, the first biography, the first account of his life by, by his, uh, his um, companion, uh, a friend there who, who uh, sort of wrote the history of Augustine's life. He responded, I'm here dying. Why isn't everyone praying for me? <laughs> so, I, I mean, I think that's, that's, that's very, um, I wouldn't say typical, but, um, but certainly uh, funny. On a more serious note, um, this was uh, actually came from, uh, as I mentioned, St. Cassidius, who was uh, the, the historian who wrote this first biography. And uh, it is Cassidius who tells the story that Augustine on his deathbed had the Psalms, many of the Psalms of David, um, uh, written out and, and, and hung on the wall so that as he, he laid his deathbed facing the wall, he read the Psalms and wept. And, uh, and not weeping for the loss of his life, as he said, but weeping for the incredible grace that had saved him. Um, so, again, we cannot overstate the, um, the significance of him. We cannot, um, cannot minimize his role uh, even to this day. He is the most studied philosopher of the Christian world. Uh, the most, in, in any sense, the most studied philosopher. And, um, and, and I do want to say that in your reader, there is, um, there is an excerpt from Confessions. I just want to make sure that you know that it is an excerpt. Uh, the Confessions is actually 13 books. It's quite lengthy, uh, but of course you are free, and I encourage you to go and read the whole thing if you'd like. But to put Confessions in its context, the part that I included, there's, there's, I, I think I've made some, some selections based on a, a couple of criteria. Uh, one of them is that it addresses his mother, uh, the portion I included addresses his mother, uh, addresses his hearing of Ambrose, uh, and, uh, and then sort of concluding with, um, with his recognition of of that initial, that initial recognition of grace, uh, sort of concluding that, that it was God who sought him. So uh, I, I chose that quite deliberately. But, but to put confessions in its context, it is sometimes, I think, as I said, called the first auto autobiography. You'll often see it referred to that way. The first ever in that genre uh, is, is St. Augustine's Confessions. But it's important, I think, to remember that it's really not an autobiography. I mean, it is an early autobiography, the first part of his life, but it's not a true autobiography because he was in his early 40s when he wrote it, and he lived 30 more years. But it is, it is often studied for its style of prose, the arrangement, the organization of the text, his ideas, the organization of all of that. And, um, but it does provide the most complete record of any person living at that time. So in that sense, it is groundbreaking uh, as an autobiography. He writes about how much he regrets having lived, led a sinful and immoral life, the role of his mother, the role of St. Ambrose. Uh, and again, it is written, I think, primarily as prayers. It reads in many, many places like prayers based on the Psalms. And, uh, of course, it is that, as he writes it, um, the, the oldest way this has been translated is, For thou hast made us for thyself, and our hearts are restless, for they rest in thee. Um, as I quoted yesterday in my email to you, um, For you have made us for yourself, because you made us for yourself, our hearts are restless until they rest in thee. Um, it's, it's sort of the summation of that. At the end of his life, at the very end of his life, Augustine was doing, even after he had stepped away from, uh, from being bishop, he was still doing battle against the Arian heresy, and I guess that's a common theme by now, right? You would think by the year 430, we're over 100 years out from the First Council of Nicaea, that we wouldn't still be dealing with that. But he was. It was his last major fight. And he also worked to bring, uh, interestingly, in a secular sense, was working at the time of his death, to bring about peace as the Vandals were invading North Africa. 
that was uh, even really to his dying breath what seems to have been the thing that was most heavily on his mind uh, at the end of his life was peace, um, world peace, in, in the sense of uh, the empire peace. Uh, now, some of you may know, there's an Augustinian order. He wrote a monastic rule about the year 400. It actually is the oldest written monastic rule in Christianity. The, um, the, the rule is, um, obviously it calls for, the, the, typically, the, the detachment from the world, a common prayer life, cloistered life of silence, but it, it is, um, if you put it in this context, he wrote this rule following the time he returned to North Africa from Milan, and when he sold all he owned and gave it to the poor, remember I told you his mother had died uh, on the way back uh, to North Africa, he kept the family house and turned it into a, a dwelling for a, a communal life. Uh, it later served um, as bishop. He gave it to priests to live in communally. The rule, though, that he wrote is significant because it departed from the earlier extreme model of the desert fathers, the, um, the, the extreme um, ascetic life of the desert fathers or desert, desert monks. It departed from that model. And he noted, actually in the rule, he introduces it by saying that that way of life was no longer productive. The world was changing. It was no longer productive, but what he wanted to do was to promote a poverty of spirit instead uh, with this rule. And so although there is an Augustinian order today in the world uh, named for him, the order institutionally today dates to about the middle of the 13th century uh, when Pope Innocent IV gave official sanction to that order by that name and gave them, it's actually a group of, of various mendicant uh, orders of the 13th century uh, begging orders that Pope Innocent IV uh, brought together and gave them the rule of St. Augustine, and uh, they took the name of the Augustinians. They don't really date to, to the early 5th century. So um, the order, historically, I find this interesting, has always had a very special devotion to Our Lady of Consolation, um, which I, I did not know, and I found very interesting, um, the Consolata uh, devotion. So yes, uh, this man, an incredible intellect, a major force, obviously, for driving the faith, a gifted philosopher, a gifted theologian, and someone whose own life bears out a model of true conversion. I'm not sure, and I know Father Peter has said this before, I'm not sure he would be canonized if he were alive today. Um, but his life is truly inspiring. He, he knew his own limitations. There is, uh, he, he said this, quote, there is no saint without a past, no sinner without a future. You know, he knew his limitations. There's just so much for us to take away, so much of what he wrote. Um, another one I love. The truth is like a lion. You don't have to defend it. Let it loose, it will defend itself. Right? You don't have to engage in arguments with people, right? You don't have to always win the fight. The truth is, and that's the context in which he's writing this, the truth is like a line. You don't have to defend it. Don't alienate people, right? Let it loose, it will defend itself. And expresses the nature of truth as an absolute, by the way, an absolute that stands alone. Another one I love, and I know you've probably all heard, if you believe what you like in the Gospels and reject what you don't like, it is not the Gospel you believe, but yourself. A brief commentary on self-will there, perhaps. Okay, so next week we're going to be looking at the life and work of the last of the great four Latin doctors. We'll be looking at Pope St. Gregory the Great uh, next week. Lots and lots, of course, to say about him. Um, he is not a contemporary of these other men, but uh, comes a little bit later. So much to explore with regard to him as well. And uh, there's actually, what I have in the reader for Pope St. Gregory the Great is a homily uh, that he gave, and I would actually encourage you, at least in this instance, I would encourage you to read it before next week, uh, just because the homily is something we're going to be discussing because of something controversial that he introduces uh, in that particular homily, and that's all I'm going to tell you because I want you to come back and hear what that is, but it's 
it's earth shattering. Does that make it more appealing? <laughs> it's earth shattering. What are you producing? Okay. Pope St. Gregory the Great next week. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks to everyone who's joined us virtually and who is joining us later by video. Uh, and look forward to seeing everybody next week. Thank you.